Civil libertarians are growing increasingly alarmed at the city administration's trends toward curbing the public's right to know and to res their restrictions on the use of taxpayer-owned property. Contrary to the open meetings law, bureaucrats negotiate vital contracts out of the public sight, withhold agency data from the media, place city hall steps off limits to speeches, and even ban stickball. I'm David R. Jones, president of the Community Service Society of New York, one of the city's oldest and largest social welfare organizations. And today, the urban agenda will look at how these restrictions diminish the city's quality of life and what we citizens can do about it. As our guest, we have city council member Ronnie Eldridge of Manhattan, an articulate critic of mayoral actions. Ronnie, you've been through a couple of administrations. Uh, is this one different? It's different. It's worse than any administration I've ever had any business with. And I've been around for a long time, since the Wagner administration, basically, although I never really worked with it. But I knew the people there. And this is the most closed. It's, um, it awards contracts, as you said, in a very closed way. Uh, it, it restricts the information that flows to the press, to the elected officials, to, to the public. And more recently, it restricts access to the very building in which uh, the legislature meets. And the irony of City Hall is that it's only the mayor who's there on the mayoral side. You know, the City Hall has two sides, and it's the yep. city council on one side and the mayor on the other. It's not even as if there were important centers of communication or agencies that are housed there that would be important. But under the guise of security, he has really closed off City Hall. Well, crime is down. Should we care? That City Hall is closed off or yeah, what? What doesn't doesn't make as long as crime is down. Well, the mayor himself has given a speech about what liberty and, uh, means, and he says that people have to give up a certain degree of liberty. I think that his philosophic underpinnings are, um, are very troubling uh, because I think he expects people to give up individual rights uh, in order to have a more controlled society. The question of crime being down, you know, is uh, one of national debate because it's right. down all over the country and undoubtedly they've contributed to keeping some of the crime down. But um, I think it's also a, um, it's a, it's a ebb and flow of crime and we, it's not ended forever. Right. Uh, and yes, we should care because I think it's, um, it's a very foreboding kind of ominous uh, uh, political atmosphere. Well, it's obviously not only limited to the steps of City Hall. It looks there were there are concrete trucks uh, and, and barriers all around City Hall. Uh, what is the argument and what is the statement by the mayor well, and his, staff of why he's doing this? His argument is international security, that ever since the bombings of the embassies in Africa that he has to take security measures and he throws out, you know, the FBI, uh, Washington, and implies, I think, that... Uh, that he's working very closely with them and that they have recommended that he take these extreme security measures. Um, some of us uh, are, have become very cynical in life and question that uh, and also feel that the measures are too extreme. Uh, so that we finally, after months of delay, and it, because a lot of the political beings were caught up in the politics of the gubernatorial election, the fact that the Speaker of the Council was running for governor, didn't want to do anything on the steps of City Hall, but finally uh, in November, uh, after Housing Works, which is a very strong advocacy group that has incurred the mayor's ire, after Housing Works had gone to court to get uh, the right to have a rally on the steps of City Hall, uh, council members finally had a press conference on City Hall because for a long time we were forbidden from doing that. And um, surprisingly, not surprisingly to some of us, nothing happened. I mean, you know, we stood up against them and we did it. Uh, so. I think that what has happened is that there isn't any opposition to the mayor on all kinds of, right. in all kinds of areas. People are afraid to stand up to him. But I, I really think he's a bully, and like a lot of bullies, if you stand up to them, you find that you can face them down. Well, I think I, I know part of this. Uh, I was on the board of the Health and Hospitals Corporation right. for five years. And we had to fight on the issue of privatization. Right. And, and, what ha and look at what happened to that issue of privatization. Right. I mean, that is really ludicrous. He had yeah. everybody spinning around. He's going to sell these hospitals. He gave right. no information. He didn't disclose the plans, right? Right. And then he couldn't sell them anyway. Well, I remember in one of the more egregious uh, uh, things that happened was the mayor directed the creation of a blue ribbon panel. And then as a board member of HHC, theoretically the fiduciary for this, we were ordered to present ourselves before the panel. Uh, to explain why privatization wasn't being implemented. 
Um, it was sort of flipping everything on its head. Uh, but standing up was very difficult for many members, and the threats flew fast and, and, and furious. Uh, let's talk about the other area. One of the, uh, in, in certainly the New York I remember, uh, this would have been met by an enormous uh, groundswell of, of opposition from the media, from protests. Why is there, why isn't this going on now? What happened here? New York hasn't suddenly changed, has it? What, what, why this sort of, uh, quiescence? I'm not I think about this a lot, and yes. I think it's extremely complicated, and we, and a lot of it is sociological, philosophical, God knows what else. Um, I think part of it is, uh, that we have seen the disappearance of political parties and strong leaders who have commitments to ideals. We've lost a sense of ideology or a sense of a common good. And what's happened is all the different groups who are interested now um, advocate on their own behalf. And there isn't a, co a, a the, part, the Democratic Party used to be the coalition right. of groups. It used to be the coalition of labor groups, the anti-poverty groups, and uh, all the different groups. But now we've split up. So everybody and a lot of these groups have taken the role of government in providing social services, and they need the money. Right. And uh, therefore, they think that they can, uh, in their terms, cut their own deals. And so we see, um, because of the lack of leadership and the lack of any kind of goals and sense of why we're doing all this in the public sector, we see each one of these groups um, working on their own behalf and more easily intimidated because mm -hmm. this is also not only a very secretive administration, it's a very vindictive administration. And people have had their contracts canceled and find themselves in a lot in dire straits of providing services. What role do you think of the disorder going on in the uh, the union movement in New York? Clearly, the union movement used to be a, a major force, uh, even in, in my younger years, right. where everyone used to tremble, and they couldn't be controlled so simply. What happened in New York? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> without <laughs> without us <laughs> getting... It not only happened in New York, it was nationally. I was just right. reminiscing yesterday about Walter Ruther. I met somebody from Detroit, and, yeah. and she said that Walter Ruther was her hero, and she grew up, and I remembered Walter Ruther very well, and also the fact that uh, at Robert Kennedy's funeral on that train going to Washington, I sat on the train with Walter Ruther, and mm -hmm. having remembered there was an assassination attempt against his life when, he was, when I was really young, uh, it was a very touching moment. We don't have national, what, what's happened is that we have, I guess, become controlled with television, with polling, uh, with the sense that leadership is to follow the general consensus, uh, with the concern for re-election of public officials. So they want to appeal to the largest common denominator wet, rather than educate people and bring them along to ideals. I mean, where's Martin Luther King? Where's, uh, where is, where Robert, Robert Kennedy, uh, some of the people that we used to rally behind right. uh, Lyndon Johnson with civil rights and Hubert Humphrey. I mean, we, we just don't ha breed people like that anymore. And I suppose, in a way, it does get pretty basic as to uh, politics and, and who comes out of the system and the way the system operates. So you can tie it all together, campaign contributions, campaign right. financing, and I think the use of television, going directly now to voters and trying to appeal to what we think they want so that people can get reelected. That's the only good thing about term limits, <laughs> except <laughs> that I actually supported term limits last time around. I didn't like two terms, and I certainly didn't support the Lauder effort, right. but I thought in a way it was the only way we would clear out local city government. We had people entrenched in the city council who had no more idea of what's going on in their districts right. and no more interest in really assuming the responsibility they're supposed to assume. Uh, so now they're all leaving, but I underestimated um, the interest of elected officials to continue to be elected. So people are running for different offices and, right. and nobody's paying attention. Off the subject, we're <laughs> talking about what is this going to mean for the new council? What, what is the new council going to How many council people? I don't know if many in our it's, it's viewers. A, it's going to be virtually the entire It'll council. It'll be, I think, around 40, I guess, something like that, 41 out of 51. And in the first year of this new operation, how is it going to work? Are they, how is the council Well, there are going to be some people who were elected this last time who are right. going to be. And they're a very interesting group. Um, I think they've already, we've already seen a big change because they came in, most of them are people of color. Mm. So they belong to what we call the Black and Latino Caucus in the council, uh, which I must say I've been very jealous about since... I vote with people who represent districts that have uh, right. poor people in and need help. 
but I've had no relationship with this group of people, and it's been very difficult for a few of us. Right. Uh, but there's been an enormous change, and all of a sudden, they really upset the traditional leadership of that caucus, which was always in the speaker's pocket. And they elected Lenaris and um, Helen Marshall as mm -hmm. co-chairs, uh, and they are a much different group of people. Um, Margarita Lopez, Phil Reed, um, Bill Perkins. Um, uh, um, uh, oh God. He comes from Brooklyn. That's why I never can remember. Uh, <laughs> What's his name? You know, um, he's great. He's terrific too. Angel Rivera, oh, and, uh, Rodri uh, Rivera, Rodriguez, Rodriguez. Angel Rodriguez from uh, Sunset Park. Uh, they're very different. Yeah. So they're going to be the leadership next time, um, and I think we may see a younger generation that may adopt new standards. Uh, 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 the council has been so controlled by the speaker. And the speaker's a very conservative person who and essentially has agreed with the mayor on large public mm -hmm. uh, issues. So it's, um, I think we may see a change. Now we have to pay attention to those local elections, though. <laughs> Let's talk again about uh, sort of the concealment of, of records. In the not-for-profit sector, getting information out of the, any city agency now has become virtually impossible. And I think all of us had assumed, basically, that the Freedom of Information Act, yeah. the legal right to... Uh, to demand of, of government officials and, and institutions that they re release documents would handle this. It clearly hasn't. Uh, we're finding the Freedom of Information Act uh, a very crude tool of trying to get, get materials released. Um, first of all, what do you see from the council side? Can you get information? So are we. I was going to say, so are we finding it an inadequate tool to get information. I chair a committee that's called the Women's Issues Committee. It has, right. um, it has oversight on uh, issues of child care. Um, uh, domestic violence, equal employment, any kind of issues relating to women, and we've recently had a series of hearings on employment of women, and of course then we have, we talk about women and minorities, right. though I think it's time for us to have a new name for minorities, since they are not the minority, but we, uh, <laughs> wait, I keep trying, but I don't know where we'll get, uh, and we got no information at all. We couldn't even get the head of the agency to come and testify. Uh, this administration is so arrogant that if they don't like how you've behaved, meaning some of your public statements or questions you may have asked, they, they don't send anybody to your hearings to testify, or they'll send somebody who doesn't know the answers. And then if you um, request the information in formal communication or correspondence, uh, you can't get it. So we were just discussing yesterday uh, foiling freedom of information, um, using the freedom of information law to get some information, but even then it takes very long time. It loses its effectiveness. Um, and it's very difficult. We've certainly seen that in the questions of the WEP program and right. the welfare to work well, program. Well, I think the, our audience would be interested. What, what has happened in terms of around the WEP program and the work experience program? Well, we don't know. I mean, you know, the administration, they did a very small, inadequate study of mm -hmm. supposedly jobs that people got afterwards. We don't believe that. We think there's a lot of churning. We, we know there's a very high percentage of people who've been knocked off of public assistance that then appeal the cases that they get reinstated, but it's that time in between and the journey. We don't know where the people are and we don't know what's happening. Um, we're going to have a joint hearing of the Women's Committee and Public uh, and General Welfare next week on child care because um, the, the, the child care of choice for the WEP program has been the informal child care, which means it's a subsidy. You hand somebody 90 seven dollars a week and they are supposed to provide their own child care uh, which I think is a flagrant abuse and incredibly stupid public policy. Well it's also going back when my agency was founded before the turn of the century one of the motivating reasons it was put together was because uh, children were putting out uh, with borders by right. the state right. and the death rate became huge. Right. Uh, the kids were being starved in care. That's not happening now but it led to a whole movement uh, to regulate and supervise okay, child, child care, care placement. Well, we don't know what the, the conditions of, of this informal care because we're not monitoring it yet. We're using public money for it. Now, I think what's happening, though, is that um, at the same time, we've tried to um, uh, enlarge the area of family daycare and to require that family daycare providers be affiliated with a network that would provide them with instruction and assistance and um, equipment and things like that and the administration has stalled that for a year so we don't know but I have the feeling now that 
um, the administration is looking to family daycare because they're finding the informal daycare unreliable, that people are not coming to work assignments because they can't find a thing. And that all of that is at the cost of the working poor families who still need child, child care. care. So instead of expanding the child care pool, I think we're substituting. That's what we're trying to find out. Yeah. Uh, but it's very difficult. What we're also concerned about is that obviously uh, the, the administration has taken a policy of trying to remove as many people from welfare as possible. We're also finding that not only are people stripped from uh, their welfare benefits, but they're also losing uh, Medicaid yeah, well that, and, yes. and other supports that they have. We're entitled to even even the most conservatives in the Congress. Which seems to me brings us back to the whole question of the Health and Hospital Corporation, right. because why are we doing these eligibility eligibility reviews to knock people off of Medicaid so they're uninsured, so they're forced then to go to the public hospital system, which is in increasingly right not getting reimbursed for the uninsured or faces a shortage of funds for that and we'll have to bear that burden in addition to competing with other managed care companies? Is that? I'm well, not I, a health care expert, so I, I'm I just think, generalizing. I think one of the concerns <laughs> we have in terms of uh, the mayor's attitude, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear, and I think the mayor at times has stated it, that he doesn't believe the city should be involved in public health. Uh, certainly not of the nature of the public hospital system. We are unique, and he mentions that uh, very often. There are a couple of other major cities, L.A. and, and Chicago, that have significant ones, but nothing close to uh, the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, he clearly, his effort to privatize it, was he, he didn't feel that was a, an essential city service. But he's filled, so filled with contradictions that that's what's amazing. He's, he expounds public policy in this very positive way. I think frequently he, he makes it up as he goes along. He sounds positive. People welcome that because they like a positive leader. Yeah. But here he is, as you said, not believing in public health, really, or in helping poor people in public health. But he gives $12 million to a cancer research study. I, that went unnoticed. I don't know if you noticed that, but, you know, Maria Mitchell put together a, a cancer study, and the city put $12 million of tax money into that. Now, now historically, medical research is, is, I think, been generally um, accepted as being funded by the federal government right. and different companies. Where we came in putting $12 million into the study, I have no idea, except that one can say he was, uh, he was helping people that have helped him. Well, I don't want to leave everyone with this, this <laughs> sense of uh, total Sorry. gloom and doom. What are we going to do about well, it? Well, I think increasingly... Uh, and it's not only for this mayor, obviously. Yeah. I mean, uh, clearly other people are taking notes of what's been so successful of, about the Giuliani administration, in addition, uh, you know, in addition to his policing and other things that he's done right. Um, clearly people are, are feeling this is a great way to be a politician. I think increasingly people are beginning to feel that he's encroaching on their own personal liberties and, and that he's, his policies are, are... I mean, I think his latest action in Brooklyn is is beyond understanding. It, it's, uh, it's ludicrous. And yesterday he made it very clear that it's just vicious, vindictiveness against this community who elected this public representative. Um, but I think that people have to get back into the political process. I think that we face a prospect of his being the senator from New York State. And that is not a good prospect. So I think people have to get back into the political politics. We're going to elect a new city council. We have a very important Senate race. We have an important presidential race. And somehow we have to make demands of that party system, and we also have to pay attention to these discussions on campaign finance. Because I think until we have really full public financing of elections and campaigns, we're never going to be able to bring to politics the kind of fervor that comes from people who are outside of the of the establishment, and that's what we need. On a shorter term, is there any way to start uh, looking at uh, a stronger Freedom of Information Act that could cut through some I of this? I don't really know that. We we have proposed and worked very closely with the Civil Liberties Union legislation that mandates uh, the use of the ste steps of City Hall, which has historically right. always been the background for the public. It's right. like Marble Arch in London or someplace yeah. or Columbus Circle once when I was growing up. Columbus right. Circle was the site of um, soapboxes, soap boxes, yeah. right. Um, so that's, we want that to be an open place. You go to City Hall now, it's very depressing. It's also, we don't have any fun in politics anymore. You know, <laughs> we used to laugh and there used to be fun. I, I always make everybody, uh, people shudder when I say this, but I met two husbands through politics. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it was great and everybody contributed to it. So anyway, our bill mandates that uh, they must allow press conferences with uh, 50 people 
and less. Right. And that we've set up a committee that has a mayoral appointment, a city council appointment, I think two mayor appointments ones, that would uh, be there in the case in the event of disputes or questions right. and would work closely with the police department. But what we're trying to do is to take the power away from the police department and put it back into the public because we think police considerations should be considered but we don't think that ever the police department should make political decisions, and that's what's happening increasingly now. It, it's um, interesting the furor, and this is going back away in a prior administration where the police were monitoring radio broadcasts uh, to see if people were saying things that, that might represent a threat, um, and, and that program had all the hallmarks, and it was identified as being right. all the hallmarks of control. Uh, and that created a storm, I think, with major demonstrations. Right. Uh, now I think this could be done. I'm sure it perhaps right. may be being done, and it's just well, business as usual. They're definitely photographing people and doing things like that, which they did uh -huh. during the, the, the Vietnam War. Sure. Um, but we, when we had the, the Housing Works rally, uh, five of our staff members, of council member staff members, were there with us, but they weren't part of it. Five of us, there were members of the council who were participating in this rally. And so they were standing on the steps watching. Uh, the court had said we could use the plaza in front of the steps, not the steps. So these five members were standing there, and the police told them to move. And we said, no, they weren't going to move. I mean, they worked for the city council, and they're standing there. And we stood up to them, and they, they backed off. But then what happened was they circled them. They had all these plainclothes people standing around them, and then somebody came and took their pictures. And it was really quite incredible. But, um, you know, I, and, and I don't think the police are all bad or anything like that, no. but I don't think they have a role in politics. And a couple last week, I, the police commissioner referred to left wingers in his statement, and of course the mayor now is calling the, you know, the garden people communists. Uh, he <laughs> made a statement yesterday, and we're always being called names, and they're names that take you back. It, it's so meaningless. Yeah. I, I think it, you know, it would be funny, except uh, I'm starting to get a sense that we're living through a period that we'll reflect on. Hopefully not the opening gun of, of some real repression. Um, well, we may be coming out of it. You asked, you said yeah. it didn't sound hopeful. I think maybe we're coming out of it. Yeah. I hope we're not going into it. Being bar bipartisan, I, I don't know if this is a Republican <laughs> right, or Democratic issue, and I'm, I'm concerned, obviously, that uh, this yeah. would be just as simple for a Democratic uh, Well, I, uh, I heard um, the, the, the majority leader of the state Senate this morning for a minute on television, yeah. and he was saying, well, there, he's getting to be a little more open about it was something to do with um, prisons, but I, I couldn't hear it. But what I did hear him say was the elections showed <laughs> that extremists are not, not, not what the public it. wants. And uh, so they're moving. And I think that the Republic, I, I mean, I am a partisan, as you've uh, right. gathered. I can't be. Uh, <laughs> that, um, the, that the Republicans, that I think we may be coming out of it, is really what I'm trying to say, although right. I don't know. And I think that we, we have to develop talent, and we have to bring some passion and conviction back to why we are serving the public. It's more than a job or a profession. It's, there has to be a reason that you want to go into public service, and that's one of the things I think we lost. Right. I, I guess uh, the, the other thing I want to know is uh, you've talked about the steps of City Hall. What about the notion of uh, uh, providing more access to information and data? Is there any uh, legislative way uh, from the City Council or the State Legislature to start <laughs> at least moving that agenda? Part of the problem is that the leadership of the Council has to want it. And so far, um, it, the, the speaker, I don't think, is, he wants to have a more open right. public, and he obviously has uh, the, the, the existence of the council at stake. I mean, it is a right. council issue. Uh, but we haven't done it, and I don't know if there is any way we can legislate. Um, uh, but I think that if they were to help us more with the foiling and to be a little more aggressive, yes, we can subpoena witnesses. So why don't we subpoena yeah, witnesses? Yeah, I think that's one of been, been one of the questions. Yeah. There are powers. I think Absolutely. people are very frightened. Absolutely. Um, and right. even though this uh, exchange between uh, Steve DiBrienza and the mayor has ended, at least for the moment, in Steve's favor, I assume. If, well, it, it has, but it hasn't. I mean, he wants to now say he's going to evict these three groups. And this, uh, that it's, it just doesn't even make sense. If you walk into the building, you have to walk up some steps. There's a center hall, and that's where the elevators are to the mental health clinic upstairs. Right. And you have to use the elevators because there are a lot of older people going there. So you need that ability to have that central hall. Then over on one side is the community board uh, office, and over here is the the child care stuff, and over here are the seniors. Well, how are you going to 
you, there's no, I mean, you're going to have to spend millions of dollars to renovate around them. And there are no shower facilities. There's, there's nothing there. So that is personal peak. And he, he said that yesterday. So it's a victory, but it's not totally. It's and then, then we'll subpoena, we'll, we'll ask the, the commissioner of HRA to appear at a hearing. He won't appear. Uh, you know, so, and, and we should subpoena them. I think that should be the next that step. Probably and we should is push the them to do that. To get, yeah. to get things done. Yeah. I know that, you know, we assume that not for profits, uh, I, I represent part of that world, uh, would be able to stand up much more strongly. I think no one had really recognized the inherent weakness in not for profits. You described it earlier. Uh, in this broadcast, uh, not-for-profits increasingly have become a substitute uh, for government services. And we, we're basically arms of the government, you are. whether we recognized it or not. Um, and the fact is that prior administrations, uh, I used to be in the Koch administration, and I remember uh, the most serious thing when, when an organization sort of went off the reservation and attacked my right. boss, uh, <laughs> was we said we might have to, at the end of the year, audit you. Right. And that was a terror. Uh, you right. know, I used to get calls of protests that that would happen. <laughs> uh, I don't think we, we were living in a fool's paradise, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think the number of programs that have been closed for political reasons has, has grown to uh, and we enormous can't, numbers. And when we, we can't even really find out the information. And then when we do, there's nothing really we can do about it. And so the not-for-profits have become very wary of publicly uh, saying anything. I think it's a soft way of putting it. Wary is, is <laughs> almost... Uh, <laughs> totally resistant, <laughs> right. But that's because they don't have a party behind them. Right. They don't have the labor unions behind Which them. Which we're hoping, I hope the new reform going on uh, with DC 37 will lead to a more vigorous you know, engagement by labor, which is sorely missing, obviously. But we're, we're seeing a, an, a very interesting phenomenon. When he talks about privatization, or when the Republicans talk about privatization, they in a way mean the growth of of not-for-profits because you are the people that are taking it over. So now we're talking more, um, when we cut the, the workforce, we're really um, hiring a lot of per diems. And yeah. they're not getting benefits, they're getting paid at different rates, and they're not counted in the headcount. And they always can be shut down. Right. Well, thank you very much. There is no question that there have been some positive changes under the current city administration. Streets are cleaner, at least in Manhattan. The crime, necessarily. <laughs> the crime rate has dropped. Because of the bid. <laughs> and tourists are visiting again. But well, less welcome are the changes restricting civil liberties. They have no place in a dem democracy, certainly not in New York. They hamper the uh, public's right to know and can't be allowed to remain unchallenged. What the city administration and every other governing body must accept is that they are only the paid employees of the public. As such, the public has a right to demand access to city records and accountability by their elected officials. This is David R. Jones for The Urban Agenda. Thank you very much for joining us. comment on the urban agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.